Um, no, oh, Edwina, okay. Um, so today for, in Hawaii, it's August 4th. And in the, many other places, it's August 5th. Today and tomorrow are the close of what is known as the Rim of the Pacific uh, maritime war games or maritime exercises. They are the largest maritime exercises in the world hosted by the United States Indo-Pacific uh, Fleet or Command in Pearl Harbor. And it's 26 nations. It's, I've heard various numbers on the amount of surface ships that are here this time. It's anywhere from 46 surface ships to 32 surface ships. It's a lot of ships, a lot of surface ships, uh, submarines, nine ground troops, and uh, tw more than 25,000 personnel that have basically inundated the Hawaiian Islands uh, over the past six weeks. As we were beginning this, uh, this inundation, as we were dealing with the, um, we, we constantly live with, the, with occupation, militarized occupation in Hawaii. And many of you also live under either American occupation or some other kind of uh, militarized occupation. Um, RIMPAC takes that occupation to the next level. Uh, and it, it creates an unbearable amount of detriment to our, to every aspect of our life, uh, the sound, the, 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 the soil, the ocean, the fresh water, the birds, the whales, the everything is threatened when RIMPAC is in town. Uh, and it's threatened by all of everybody else's countries coming uh, to play at war. And one of our initial responses and the response that we do for many things um, is we ask our artists, we ask artists in every genre to respond to how they're feeling how they feel about militarization in the Pacific, how they're feeling specifically about RIMPAC, um, any other kind of militarized uh, games or exercises that are happening as we play, play at war and build up this uh, yet another threat, right? Another yellow peril in the Pacific to create, to justify increased militarization. And so what we did was invite artists from all over the world, but all over the Pacific to share with us their responses. And we've gotten a beautiful response. If folks are, um, if anyone who, if you're here and you haven't seen the, the online exhibition that has been running since June 29th, you can see it at youngsawara.com, uh, youngsawarapacific.com, excuse me. I'll put that in the chat. Um, and we just received an amazing amount, uh, an, a wonderful range of visual art, poetry, uh, videos, theater, all kinds of things. And we are gonna have some of our artists and some of our um, kind of political activists who are who will be joining us late, a little later to share their work, talk about what motivated them, motivated them to, share, to, to share the work that they uh, put into the exhibit. And we are also going to uh, allow folks, you can still use that thread. I might change, I might change the email, but we're gonna still allow folks to continue to submit, just not for not just for RIMPAC, for, for how you feel about militarization in general uh, ongoing. Um, because we're realizing that we can't just stop at RIMPAC. This was this was the beginning of a form of resistance that needs to keep going. Um, so normally I would say, let's kick this off with the first person on the flyer, but they're not all here yet. So I'm gonna start out with some other folks that are actually in the room and maybe even invite those folks um, who were not, not asked to speak, but are here, right? So, um, cause I'm very excited about that possibility as well. So of our speakers who are here, would anyone like to volunteer to go first on what 
uh, of the, about their work and I'm happy to share screen to show their work um, or I'll allow you, or I think you can all share screen yourself if you want to. So who would like to go first? I'm looking at Tale, Nick, Roldy even. I All right, I'm, okay, sorry, does someone else want to go? Oh. Otherwise I can, I can go. Okay. okay. I've been joy. Um, yeah, my name's Tale and I'm joining from unceded Ngunnawal Nambri um, Indigenous lands, which is otherwise known as Canberra in Australia. And yeah, I'm a diasporic Fijian woman um, who was born and raised on uh, Gadigal land of the Aura Nation um yeah so I'm a settler and yeah learning about RIMPAC through joy and others about militarization in the Pacific has been really important to me to understand um yeah Australian militarism um and my contribution I guess was kind of reflecting on that history um of Australian participation in RIMPAC um and they were a founding member from 1971, which really shocked me because, you know, the only time, the first time I heard about RIMPAC, I was thinking about it the other day, was uh, about 10 years ago when I was about 18. Um, and I was a Rihanna fan and I decided to go and see this movie called Battleship. Um, I don't know if anyone has seen it before, but that was my first um, interaction, which is very strange and abstract when you think about it, but it's like very Hollywood as well. And it was basically about, um, you know, the RIMPAC exercises, you know, talking about how it was like peaceful, but then there was like an alien invasion in the middle of it. So it wasn't really where they, you know, used all their war weapons against this alien invasion. And you can read into that all types of way that you want, but yeah, that was kind of the first time I'd ever heard about RIMPAC in this um, quite a strange way, way. I wasn't ever going to see it in, you know, wouldn't have seen this movies, this movie otherwise if Rihanna wasn't in it. Um, but yeah, from that going on, like, I didn't really have that many critical thinking skills at that time in my life. But, you know, since I've kind of come to understand, yeah, what Australia's relationship to RIMPAC and how we've been participating in it since 1971. So yeah, for this, um, my contribution, I initially wanted to do a screen print, but um, it ended up just being a um, digital collage. Um, and I might share my screen now. Um, oh, sorry if that's, I don't know if that's big. Maybe I'll do it like this. Um, Cause I wanted to understand for myself um, the history of RIMPAC or how, RIMPAC has been talked about in the Australian media because, I mean, most people I know don't know about Australia participating in RIMPAC since 1971. And what I found was that most of the reporting that I could find, and I was using this website called Trove, um, which has all these old periodicals of, um, you know, of Australian newspapers and that type of thing. And I could see that RIMPAC was mostly only uh, represented in defense periodicals. So it was like a very specific, um, you know, very specific newspapers talking to a very specific group of people. And besides that, all I could see was like silence um, basically from the mainstream Australian media about this um, since the 1970s. Um, and you can kind of see the defense periodicals are in the background. Um, and it was really interesting just to see all the different types of um, like, how proud Australians were to be debuting different, you know, ships and, um, you know, like, for example, Orions and um, different types of helicopters and, um, yeah, just harpoons, all these different type of things um, since 1971, um, all the way into 2000s and the aesthetics type of change, it shows happy um, white um, servicemen participating, Australians are very celebratory of it. Um, but yeah, it, and then I found this one thing up here, which kind of 
you know, confirmed what I'd been thinking when I was looking through these periodicals, which was national newspapers seldom take a great deal of interest in military exercises involving Australian forces overseas, um, which I put at the top there. Um, and yeah, besides that, I mean, the one, like, I guess, interventions, maybe the wrong word, but, you know, breakthrough, like, I, that went against this, like, regular reporting was, um, you know, grassroots periodicals, like, that were related to um, protect Ka'olawe, Ohana, and um, nuclear free and independent Pacific movement. And, um, yeah, so organizations like that, that offered, you know, the alternative, oh, you know, the alternative press in particular kind of spoke it back against that from what I could see in like the archive in Australia. Um, so yeah, I decided to kind of represent these um, or like by pulling some of the logos, like um, stop the bombing up here. And I've colored them myself and the logos for nuclear free and independent Pacific movement. And, um, you know, with Pacific periodicals, what I love about them is that there's so many um, images and drawings and that type of thing, um, which is just so different to the aesthetics of defense periodicals. Um, so yeah, I kind of just wanted to bring Pacific, that Pacific, um, yeah, um, imagery to be seen as kind of like this interruption. And yeah, um, I thought that was really interesting when you're thinking about when I was thinking about like circular circulations of media and reflecting on it today, I guess I might just stop sharing there. But yeah, like we don't, um, yeah, even today in the Australian media, um, we haven't heard that much about it. Um, even, and I don't know, I feel like with like the new Labour government, you know, they're talking about climate change and having a First Nations foreign policy, but you know, this issue of Australians participating in like the desecration of Kanaka Maoli sovereign lands is, you know, completely appalling. And I think it really stands against, you know, what the new government kind of alleges what they're about. Um, so yeah, it's like brownwashing and greenwashing in that sense. Um, so yeah, I don't know. I, yeah, for me, this was just kind of good to take us take stock of how it's being portrayed and maybe other people in the room would have more information on it but of like that history of Australia reporting but that's kind of what I found through this work sorry if I went on too long there well that was perfect uh mahalo for that uh for giving I my favorite thing about listening to artists is hearing their process and hearing how they came to the decisions they made with the work that they're doing um, you know, you know, you see a collage and honestly, people will make, I'm always surprised when I listen to the artists and what other people, how other people interpret what you did. So thank you so much. And as an archivist myself, like using the arc, using the deep dive in the periodicals and, and manipulating that, uh, to think through an issue, which is what we do, right? We're thinking through a problem that seems insurmountable. So how do you think through a problem, right? Artists use art to solve, to problem solve, right? We're, we're thinking about an impossible, impossible ways of addressing an impossible situation, right? In the realm of art, we can be impossible. We can imagine the impossible. Uh, mahalo. Uh, did, and Nate, did you want to follow uh, Tale? Wow, that was, that was really brilliant. Um, Tale, thank you. I, I'm a little intimidated actually to follow up. Um, I there's so many things like I would like to speak to um, from the presentation. First off, you know, Joy, thank you so much for convening us, half a day and Sanamasi, everybody. Um, I love this idea that this is going to be a living exhibit, you know, a living uh, community of expressions, um, articulations about, you know things we want to change in our colonial realities or in our heavily militarized, hyper-militarized homelands. So I, I'm really excited about that. And maybe I can, uh, yeah, I, I, I love that idea. So thank you. Um, but Tale, I just, I, I love um, that your work, your work is just so powerful. Um, you know, 
I really appreciate this idea you talk about also about awakening to the truth, you know, and this sort of way we develop a, a critical sharper eye, you know, and your eye is so sharp and so critical, uh, you know, for you to, to go through the history of, of the reporting. Uh, Guam also has a media that's, that has a history, it has its start in military news and you, you know, we have critiqued sort of some of the absence of reporting on, on military exercises or other things, other, you know, or, or presenting bias about military activities here. But I, I really appreciated your work so much and looking at the grassroots uh, media as well. I just think of our grassroots media here. Anyway, it's just, it was just phenomenal. Thank you so much. And um, let's see, uh, I've got, I've got, uh, I, I wasn't, I was, I was just so, into uh, sorry into the last presentation I'm a little well I can show I have the actual images here so you know lately I've been I haven't been doing as much art making as I would like and sometimes when you've stepped away from something that's such an important part of your practice and something that is such a, a big part of your identity and who you are uh, when you come back to it you've just you're, 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 you're just dealing with a lot of other things, you know, and with the, the chaos, the constant chaos of, of everything happening, you know, RIMPAC, um, everything happening here, um, everything happening in the world, it's, it's just really hard to sort of be able to be still, you know, and um, for me, a, a lot of the art making lately has been protest signs. So I actually really tried hard to not do a, a, some protest signs this time. Um, although I, I really did I, I, I really did, and I might still put those in, but um, I, I had to have a play. I just had to have a play, and I just had to keep playing with materials and um, to see what was coming up for me because I was flooded. I felt flooded, you know, with um, with a lot of things happening. Flooded here in Guahan, in my things happening in my personal life, in our in our activist community, in you know. And, and uh, everything happening with all the work we're doing uh, to stop all kinds of military violence here, you know, whether it's it, the lawsuits we're engaged in. I mean, it's just, there's just all, all so much noise and so much work to do, and it could just feel so depleting. Like, <laughs> you know, um, like militarization is, it's exploitive and depleting. I mean, and, and to live in a military economy, to live in a colonial, this, this colonial reality every day, right? It's just, there's just so much noise and you just gotta find joy and you gotta find the stillness. And so all I could do was play, all I could do was play. And something that kept um, coming back to me and something I, I kept listening to was the collaborative poem in a world without RIMPAC that the Cancel RIMPAC Coalition uh, put out um, two years ago. Joy was one of the producers, of course, and. Mikey in a way, and um, I, I'm pretty sure everybody here has seen it, but I just, um, you know, I'm, I've been following RIMPAC, um, I've been looking at all the news, I, you know, in terms of talk, looking at the media, I saw a story, uh, I saw an interview with Kim, um, I saw this, I, you know, the, this, the, the, the news coverage where they were inviting folks to come in on the ships and try the food, and I thought of military propaganda a lot also, and we just had our Liberation Day slash Reoccupation Day uh, festivities here. And those are also hyper-militarized. Those have, those feel like propaganda, you know, a lot of times. And just thinking about how we're flooded with all of that. Um, so looking at all the images, you know, of the explosions in the ocean, looking at all of the aircraft, um, you know, reading about all of the news reports of, the violence against the gendered violence, the violence against women, and then um, also looking at all the actions, the, the incredible actions taking place uh, occupying Pearl Harbor and uh, watching uh, Kim do those great uh, uh, <laughs> press conferences, you know, looking at theater in, as protests and performance art as protests and music as protests, and, and of course. Every, all of us, this gathering is protest. Um, it's it's just such a powerful place to to draw love and strength and inspiration from uh, in all this chaos and noise. And so um, I just deeply appreciate uh, being a part of this project, uh, being able to meet all the amazing artists and activists of Young Sawara Pacific, 
um, working with Joy and our friend Isa with our Commonwealth uh, 670. Um, and just seeing all the amazing work, it's just been a, it's been, it's been great to be a part of some, I'm very grateful. Uh, so I was feeling a lot of love, you know, and there were, there were some lines um, in that poem that just kept echoing and, um, you know, the, the repetition of she will breathe and, and we will breathe free, freely freedom. Um, so I took those, some of those lines from the poem and, and I did a piece um, in response or in reflection of, of that. And so I, I know Joy can screen share it, but I, I also have, have, have it here and I thought it might be interesting to sh show the actual piece um, a little bit up, I don't know, in person and up close. Um, but we, we'll also do the, the screen share. Okay, I think and... I'm gonna screen share it. <laughs> okay, <laughs> I don't know. Uh, let me see if I can find that. Oh, I, I, oh, I can do it. I can. I, can. Okay, I got you. Wait, okay, I, got, okay. I got someone else's art up first. Hold on. Okay. Oh, yeah, that's amazing. Oh, there's Rowdy. And Rowdy's here. I really hope we get to hear from Rowdy. Ah, yes. Here we go. Uh, right there. Right right above Tully's. Right? Yeah. 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 There she is. Yeah. So the one on the right is the, is the first one I... I did, um, and and you know, I just I don't know. It just was a lot of play. I had to play it, so it's a bunch of different material. It's um, color pencil, crayon, watercolor, acrylic paint, marker. Um, I just kept playing and just kind of let just things uh, emerge on their own. Um, I kind of had this heart jellyfish. I, I was really thinking about um, you know, the heart of the ocean and the heart of our planet and, and all of our hearts. And um, I just I, I just kept coming back to this image. So um, <laughs> and then he, the second one I did, actually, I did, ended up not submitting. I don't know if I should show it, but um, I ended up not submitting it to the exhibit, but it, it sort of it looked like um, a person drowning. And I, I mean, cause I did feel, I did feel flooded and I did feel like I was drowning, you know, as I mean, we, I think we all feel that way from time to time and just completely exhausted. Um, yeah, just surviving every day and, uh, and dealing with um, everything we're dealing with in the middle of a, of a global pandemic, which people also want to pretend is over. So um, then here, on the left is a, a second version, She Will Breathe. And I have, it's a watercolor, it's also mixed media. So it's got watercolor marker, color pencil in there. But um, I, th I thought this was definitely a more powerful, empowered image of, of the, the ancestor or the spirit or the, you know, the embodiment of the ocean, the embodiment of freedom the embodiment of um, true liberation, you know, and and also our journeys as people. So there's canoe shapes, there's blood drop shapes, there's roots and veins and um, currents <laughs> and omelet and seaweed and um, waves and pottery patterns, pictographs of turtles and people. There's all this different imagery and a lot of coral, a lot of coral. Um, reef kind of just layered on top of each other. So that's that's basically everything in a nutshell. Um, you know, we I did want to I did want to share one story. We were hoping to do a, a cancel room pack action and we couldn't. It, um, it's just been hard to find like a space to um, you know uh, to have it is hard to find spaces to have these conversations. There is some resistance or obstruction. Um, and it just reminds me uh, that we just we just we have so much work to do to to create spaces for these kinds of conversations for this kind of critique and analysis. So I just and to be creative and to to you know yeah connect over something else some, something other than the violence. I mean we're looking at the violence constantly. We can't unsee it. We can't unsee the truth. We can't stop looking at it, but we can choose to respond with um, you know with 
with all of these powerful intentions and with with uh, with love. So um, that sorry that might have sounded cheesy, but um, yeah, I'm just <laughs> really grateful and honored to be here with you all. And um, Santa Masi, everybody, and I really hope we get to hear from Rowdy, who uh, you know was who submitted and whose beautiful work is uh, for, uh, you know featured on the flyer for this event. And um, and, I'm, and I also want to say hi to my friend Yaz, who's a weaver and an artist uh, who's, who I hope contributes to this beautiful growing exhibit. And um, Yaz and I were on a, a webinar just a few days ago too about, you know, it, just talk, also talking about um, struggles in West Papua. And so this, um, what I love is that also Young Sawara has an amazing exhibit. Um, a few, a few West Papua exhibit that I hope everybody takes a look at. But I just love this idea that um, we, the Pacific, our Pacific movement, our Pacific co community is growing through, through this work. And um, yeah, I just want to thank Young Sawar again, uh, and Koa Features, and everybody uh, for making this amazing project um, happen. And it's so timely. It's so important. So Sanamasi. Hello, Hanik. Yeah, I think you touched on something that was really powerful. In the one piece that we, we didn't put online was the um, the sense of feeling like you're drowning. Um, but I think one of the things we were also thinking about is where is the hope uh, in when we're in these situations? Because like the, the drowning piece is easy, right? It was like, but imagining breathing, imagining a world beyond militarization, that's that's a little harder to imagine and draw sometimes. Um, but our our next, I'm hoping that uh, our next speaker, Louisa, will be uh, Louisa, but I have not heard a confirmation that she's willing to go. Yeah, okay, excellent. Aloha, Louisa. Well, I'm not good one. Uh, all right. Um, well, I'm not good to everyone. I'm, I'm sorry, I, I just got in from, uh, we have a workshop here in uh, Holiday Inn. Um, the poem that um, when, when I thought about Rimpak, um, immediately my mind went on to um, Nanoke or the seafood basket. Um, I'll share the, the poem. Nanoke, weaved together by reams of fresh coconut leaflet, we call it a fire fountain bag, an immeasurable depth. Bumbu's voice, a mixture of delight and pride as she lovingly gives to me my first homework. Like hot stones, I felt the heat of every word flowing from her. Nanoke, the earth's bread. Nanoke, it's the oyster's bed. Nanoke is the resting place for our head. Her soft voice and wrinkled smile enveloped with directions. Molaitha Mbuka, Molaitha Nimumai na Sasalu ni Waitui, Molai Vili Niu. I watched her mbumbu hands carry the noke for decades. She gently straps it on me, beautiful cassette designs printed on the sides, memories of and memories from and a proverb a guide. And the largeness of we in a tide is stronger than the tide in a wee, and her pale gray hair and sleepy eyes, she's laid to rest. Bumbu, our noke is heavy on my back, the fire fountain that keeps us warm is at war with the flame burning our feet. It, an unwelcome burst, an exhibition of forced injection, wrapped with disconnection and deception. And it's dressed up as special operations for human protection. Bumbu would say, we look back to look forward. Our noke is our home for living creation and their generations, a combination of uh, determination and willful migration. 
Um, and that's the end of the, the poem. Um, when I was writing it, uh, I was reflecting on Wimpec, I was reflecting on military exercise in the region, mining, transporting, and dig digging up the seafloor for rare earth minerals. And um, it took me to a place where uh, when, you, when you disrupt the ocean floor, you, you take away the, the marine animals' food source and the habitat, but also you take away the seafood basket from the communities. You take away the process of traditional cooking, the indigenous names and the cultural linkages from, from where, you know, these, uh, these marine lives, they, they are our relatives and linkages on land and, and they, we work alongside each other. Um, and so when you destroy the marine life, you also destroy the knowledge and the relationship. Um, and, and that led me to questions around assessment, um, tools of assessment, criteria of assessment, why assessment. Uh, some weeks ago, I was in a training where the facilitator talked about the self and how it can be an, an object of assessment. Uh, I went home on that day with a heavy heart um, and I reflected on that and I, you know, I asked myself, when was the time uh, we as indigenous persons were ever not assessed? Our minds are assessed, our spirits are assessed, our body is assessed, our story assessed, our ocean assessed, our land assessed. We are in a constant object of assessment. And I know that, you know, I'm, I'm cautious, cautious with the assessment and I know that, that it's a source of evidence of the impact of, um, you know, disruption, uh, disruption and the destruction that's happening in our communities. But also I feel deeply in my heart that saying no should be enough. That there is value in saying, you know, no, we don't want this. That should be enough because then we create, I feel that we, they assess us and then they, they ask us for evidence. And I thought that that was a point where I was like, wow. And then we have to assess ourselves again to provide as evidence for why it shouldn't happen. But I feel that saying no should be enough. Um, and yes, that's from me, Naka. Mahalo nui loa, Louisa, that, um, you know, right now we are, your, your, your words actually are, going, are, are making me want to cry because um, right now they're asking us to once again go through an assessment for Mauna Kea for an environmental, environmental impact statement when we've already told them in every possible form, no, we don't want it. And we've given them the reasons, we've given them the evidence, we've shown them the archeological sites, we've shown them the, the cultural importance, we've shown them the, the, the relationship to uh, the, all the relationships, and they still want to find a way to justify putting things on our most sacred mountain, on one of our most sacred mountains. We tell them we don't want them to come back with the military and they, they constantly say, well, we need to assess that when you just, literally poisoned 93,000 people in our drinking water. So when I, when I listened to, when you just, you said it so perfectly that we are a constant object of ass assessment by them. And then we also have to provide them with evidence about why we're telling them no on our, con in our countries, in our land, right? Uh, so, Yes, thank you so much that the, your poetry is, is always so powerful, but like listening to you, um, your thinking and how your thinking has, just even listening to your thinking, the way it's grown and changed and strengthened over time has been, has really been um, powerful for me to hear. I can really hear that in you, like hear that, that, um, that strength in you developing and that ability to say no. Uh, and stand in and stand very firmly in that no, 
because we know what we want to say yes to. Um, and so Mahalo, I'm going to follow this amazing poet with another poet who, a poet and visual artist and someone who is also a binding force. Uh, Crystal, do you want to take it away? Hi, hello everyone from Fiji. Um, I'm speaking to you from Fiji at the moment. Um, thank you for allowing me the space and it's great to hear all your wonderful voices and pieces and I appreciate everything you have to say. Um, always a learning point for me. If you allow me, um, I'll now talk about my painting. Um, do you think you could pull up the... Sorry, Jay, do you think you can um, share the um, painting and... Thank you. Um, the name of this painting is uh, My Mana, and uh, Mana for many in the Pacific means spirit or spirit body. And uh, so here we have a woman who's holding the sun and is also in the shape of a, of a nautilus and is also a mathematical. Um, structure for the Fibonacci sequence. Um, I chose this for RIMPAC because I think one what affects one part of the ocean will affect all parts of the ocean. And that being knowing that we are all connected one way, one way or another, wherever it is, we are all going to be affected. And so I admire what Lisa had to say about assessment and evidence saying no should be enough, but it always seems like whatever we have to say is never enough. And, uh, other than that, this painting is also to symbolize um, the light and dark times and where we are right now fighting to find some kind of leverage and still trying to find our way through navigation, through navigation and understanding our own place and where we stand with, with our values and, and with where we are in this world. Um, and so my inspiration for this painting and bring back was just togetherness and unity. And the ocean is what brings us together from dusk till dawn, even though through breath we're connected. The strongest physical body and evidence that our connection is great is the ocean itself. And um, yeah, that was my inspiration for the painting. And now I shall move on to talk about my poetry. Um, my poetry is called um, My Mana, My Home. Um, and I had written this actually after I had um, sat through the Batini Talanoa conference for the PIFs. And uh, in one of the items that was uh, that took place on one of the days of the conferences. There was a there was a group of performers from uh, this original group of dancers, and they had said something. Um, they said "Jangana," which was new to me, and it said, uh, and it it translates to "We don't own the earth; the earth owns us." And so, what belongs will always go back to where it came from. And 
that inspired me to write the, the poem and rip pack and how everything we are with connection to the ocean is also a part of who we are. And uh, I shall now read to you my poem. If you haven't read it or haven't heard it, it goes, you are welcome not to my stolen lands, my quiet grounds or my croaking voice, my beating heart, I hear her not, I see her not. Her children bear the mark of extinction and her children water bound. Her children lost and never to be found, the silence is crippled limbs of the already dead. Resounding chants of my ancestors' bones quiver in their graves, must we disturb departed. Her voice is sinking deep into the bellows of the ocean. Turning in her rotten corpse, you hear her not, you fear her not. You don't recognize her, her hands cold to brace, yet fall apart. Her tiring tongue of lost hope in her boneless dream, her dying soul. She weeps, you bleed. For who are we without she, Mana Moana, in everyone and everything we see? So what have you done and who are you now? What do you know? Leave my lands alone. From this perspective, I'm talking about how the mother is, the mother in this scenario is the ocean. And we are the children fighting to be found, fighting to know who we are and who are we without her. Anyway, thank you for giving me the time. Mahalo. Uh, Crystal, you were the, I think, the only one who submitted both poetry and the visual piece to this exhibit. And I, I deeply appreciate your willingness to share so much of your, uh, your talents, your gifts with, in this exhibition. And I, and like I said before, it always uh, inspires me to listen to what was going into the thinking behind a painting or behind the poem, because people will look at a, a painting and they'll look at it for 30 seconds and they can't know all the things that you're thinking. They, they're not gonna look at, they're not gonna say, oh, Fibonacci sequence right away, right? They're not gonna see that. And that's why these telenovelas are so important because when you, allow artists to talk about their work and the and the thinking and the and the depth that goes that's much more like the choice of painting versus like whether that's or some other kind of material all of those things it makes a difference in how we process our the information and deal with what's happening in the world right so your work um but being able to do that both because a lot of times a painting informs a poem and a poem can inspire a painting. So they go together, those two pieces work together, uh, both speaking about the role of ocean as mother, uh, as parent, and who, you know, who we are as people, how who we belong to. Um, and you're also sharing the connectivity with other indigenous cultures in your work. So, uh, you know, mahalo for that, 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 um, I really loved reading about the Fibonacci sequence when I when you submitted it. And I was like, oh, this is great. This is, you know, when we bring in all these different other ways of looking at what is on the surface, a very simple piece, but has all of these layers, right? Uh, and I think that's the thing about art that people don't always get is that it's not the surface. It's all of the other layers that go into the making of it. And I believe Hefrani has joined us. So mahalo, Crystal. Uh, we are now going to hear from Hefrani Barnes, I believe, if she's ready to go. Are you there? Yes. Can we see uh, you? Uh, hey. Hello. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Uh, this is quite last minute for me, very unprepared. Uh, uh, hi, um, this is... Uh, <laughs> Take your time. <laughs> um, uh, 
sorry, um, I'm here to talk about my art piece, right? Yes. Okay. Sorry. <laughs> sorry, yeah, as I said, really unorganized. So um, as you've all seen, I'm pretty sure you have seen my um, recent painting, a current painting, which is called Each Strand of Hair. Um, that painting um, took around two weeks to do, and uh, it was inspired by one of the legends from Guam, um, uh, how um, uh, the women, uh, <sighs> okay, sorry. Uh, the painting draws its inspiration from a story about how we love and can save the world. The story uh, goes on from the old days, uh, from the land of Guam, when the people lost their connection to their ways, and the rain could not come, and the people grew uh, wild with hunger. A giant fish determined to destroy the fish, uh, the island, uh, begin to eat. Um, I'm sorry, I'm really bad at this. <laughs> it's okay, take your time. Uh, There's no question. So, okay, I'm just gonna, okay. Um, this is my first Zoom meeting and exhibition uh, about the art piece. I'm just going to rephrase it um, and pretend I didn't say that. Um, this painting, Each Strand of Hair, was inspired by um, the legend of Guam about how uh, these women um, offered their help to the men who were trying to protect the island of Guam. And also, I was also inspired not only with the legend, but also with how um, the, the, the Navy, the Marine, uh, who are trying to, uh, trying to um, study our marine animals and use them as uh, nuclear weapons. So this painting, uh, I recreated it into a more futuristic and modern, but also with traditional um, uh, traditional art forms to it. So this painting holds more meaning to what it looks like. It is very simple, but yet, like I said, it holds a lot of meaning to it. As you can see, when you observe with the painting, um, there is women um, there who are, uh, are preventing the, this beast to destroy the land, but this, this piece shows that they are out at sea. And they are have they, they with their chants, you can see the designs that uh, show that, that that's what um, uh, it, it, it does. And um, uh, yeah. Um, yeah, so sorry about this. I'm very kind of disappointed at myself right now because I, I could have done a better job with explaining. Um, um, but all I can say is as much as I want, like as I try to explain what this piece, the meaning of this art piece, each strand of hair holds, the painting itself has its own voice. And it with the painting, it has, for, for people's different perspective, it has many stories to tell. So all in what I'm trying to say here is that as much as I want to explain how uh, this paint, this story, what the painting is all about, basically it has its own voice. Um, so, so yeah, um, I, I hope I explained. Does anyone, do you guys, anyone have a question? about the painting. Um, uh, okay, take a deep breath. Sorry, Joey, I, uh, Joey, I think I'm 
my cut. Um, no, I just want to uh, appreciate Efroni's painting. Uh, as you can see, it's in the background. Yeah. Uh, it's really huge. It's really huge, and I really appreciate uh, the the level of detail and the effort putting in, you know, like into putting that piece together. Thank you so much, Efroni. Um, yeah. And sorry, I stole the painting uh, from. <laughs> <laughs> Which are I now going to you, spend but, lots yeah. of money. No. <laughs> the Thank and you so you. much for the, yes. Thank you. Yes, Nick, you have a question. Yeah, Hefroni, uh, Sagamasi, thank you so much for this painting. I immediately recognized what it was when I saw it on the exhibit page. And uh, this is my favorite story. So I'm, I'm from Guam, I'm Chamorro, and this is a story that uh, at one of the stories in the painting, the story of the women who saved Guam, they cut off their hair and they made this net. And this story when I was a little kid was my favorite story and it's still one of my favorite stories. And, and it is used often, uh, like a lot of, there are activists who have referred to it in terms of women fighting against the military here. So I just love that you made that connection in this piece. Um, I'm so grateful for it. And um, you did a wonderful job talking about it and speaking about it and, uh, and yeah, just thank you so much. Um, I, I almost made a piece about the legend myself and I didn't. And, um, um, but seeing it, I, I just thank you so much for, for sharing it and for being here and for, and for sharing your thoughts. Uh, it's such an honor to meet you. And yeah, it's, inc it's an incredible work, Sanamasi. Thank you. Um, yeah, I, I have, um... As much as I wanted to explain this piece properly in, in my head, it's, I guess, like I said before, the painting does the job. As, um, and it has, like I said already, the painting has its own voice and with different people's perspective, they would think a bit, you know? Um, and yeah, uh, so it, that, uh, that painting took around two weeks to do. I was very inspired by, by the legend and also with the, the marine um, and the testing, the, new, the testing on the, our marine animals and a bit like, and while painting it, I very, like, I was very, I really enjoyed the process of painting this art piece as I, for the Pacific, I want to embrace not only just traditional art, but more make the Pacific art more modern and futuristic. Well, for me right now, it's with futuristics and all. So, yeah. So thank you, thank you. I'm, I'm really honored to be here as well in the, my, my first Zoom um, exhibition to be here, so. Thank you. Mahalo, Hafrani. This Honestly, I am a huge fan of yours. I have been, I, you're all over the Young Sawara um, website for different, so it's, it may be the first Zoom, but it's not the first online presence that you have. You have very much a presence as a Young Sawara artist. And you may, be, I think you're actually our youngest artist to submit. And so I want folks to just recognize, like her pieces are massively big. And she's celebrated throughout uh, Fiji and other, uh, throughout the Pacific, right? And um, so the best artists I know have no idea how to explain their work. So right. if, like, I don't know what to say right now. Like the work is talk, like I took me two weeks. I was thinking all these things. I was tied into a legend, boom. Don't worry about not being able to always explain it. Um, that only matters for funders. <laughs> <laughs> But otherwise than that, uh, we feel, you know, like obviously your 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 speak that piece spoke to folks from Guahan before you said anything. So and I love the idea of a, a future Pacific, of imagining a, a Pacific futurism. Uh, you know, we don't talk about that enough. Uh, we love our legends, but we need to see those legends and that we need to make new legends for the future. Uh, for those generations following us um, and also those 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 generations coming before us right so the the 
the, this, this, the sort of move for sci-fi is actually happening quite a bit. So you're right on time with this, with this approach. And I really highly, highly encourage you to explore this uh, as much as you can. I wish I could just spend my time doing it as well. <laughs> but yeah, mahalo, you. mahalo, Nuilo. Uh, thank you so much for taking the time to submit. I know it was a bit of a scramble, you know, but just know that RIMPAC's coming around in two years again. So um, you have plenty of time to make another one. So uh, thank you. I want to invite a speaker who is an artist who was on the flyer but who wasn't um, on the flyer to speak, but he was lit, like, they were literally the artist that is the event flyer. So uh, I want to invite Rowdy to come and, and share their work and um, their inspiration and their thinking about this project. project. Uh, hi, hello, half a day, aloha, talofa, noaie, bulabinaka, uh, yokwe, all the beautiful languages that come from the ocean that connects us. Um, Wahusi Rowdy, thank you so much for having me here um, and for using my, my photo for the flyer. It turned out really beautifully. I, I love what you did with it. <laughs> uh, but I'm calling from the island of Guahan. Um, I'm here until next week and then I'm going back to Seattle, which I'm really sad about. So I've been trying to we are going to Seattle too. Wait, wait, wait. We're going to be in Seattle next week. Oh my gosh, cool. We should connect because I will be there. Uh, how long will you be in Seattle for? From the 9th to the 13th. We can talk about it later. <laughs> okay, we'll go. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, but, but yeah, so I, I've been on Guahan for about a month. It's been five years since I was last back. And so um, I'm a different person. I think the whole world's a different person, different people. And uh, it's been really lovely to connect with the land, with the sea, especially. I love, I miss. Seattle has cold waters. I love the waters there, but the oceans of the Pacific are, you cannot, um, it, it cannot compare. And so being here, one of my favorite things is just floating in the ocean, just feeling held, um, feeling uh, connected to something larger than myself, right? I think sometimes I forget that in the diaspora when I'm in, in Turtle Island, um, just trying to make it. Um, but I appreciate, um, Appreciate Hafrani's work um, and also about sci-fi because I think that's a lot of the work that I want to do. I love our legends. I love I love remembering, but I also want to. Um, this was a phrase spoken by some Maori uh, practitioners that that we have to speak ourselves into the future, and I and I really love that. I, I it really helps guide me in thinking about what I want to see. And so the art piece that I made is a is a digital portrait um, that uh, I was just. Uh, thinking about, I was in Seattle but, and I was just like, I wanna be in the water, but I don't know how to. And so I wove a paper net. So the net you see around, I wove it myself or I made it myself out of paper string. Um, and I was thinking about my dad a lot. My dad was a fisherman and he used to take me on the reefs to go fishing. And uh, it's been really lovely to come back to the waters this way. And, uh, but it's also, I wanna think about what is it that I wanna to give to other people too. and. I love what you said, Joy, that art is a place where imagination can, can exist, where there's so much possibility. And so I think I really appreciate artists for dreaming and believing and hoping, right? There's a lot of grief, yes, a lot of anger, but also a lot of hope. And I, and I really want to center hope a lot, especially in a lot of like things that we fight for. We fight every single day. Um, but I also hope that we get to rest a little bit and art allows for me to rest for a second, to be in someone else's story, to know that I'm not alone in my story. Um, so I created this piece, it's called uh, Taladza 3000. So Taladza is the Chamor word for um, uh, um, throwing net. And I say 3000 because I wanted to see something in the future. What would it look like if, if, if we as specific people had all our like all autonomy to be in the ocean as much as we want to and not have to ask permission from these outside forces to give us access to something that was always ours, right? Or not always ours, but like we were part of, right? And so this is uh, just a way for me to center myself in my in a story, in a Chamorro story, um, in a Pacific story, um, one that isn't a response to colonialism, but it, it is there. But it's it's a it's a response to my indigeneity, um, 
centering that first because I know sometimes as an artist I would fight and make stuff that uh, could push back against things um, but I would always want to give spaces for imagination and like play like if Rimpak, Rimpak can play we can play too and I want us to play with our imagination as much as we can because we were ingenious people our ancestors were so smart and beautiful and they traveled oceans people and I'm just like, I don't think I could do that. I'm a land person. I like to stay on the reef. I don't know. Being in the open ocean is a little scares me, <laughs> but I'll stay on the reef. You know, I'll, I'll weave some things. Like today, I, I wove this little um, fish or two. But, but yeah, no, thank you so much for um, allowing me to share this and uh, to be connected to other folks who also wanted to protect something that is so sacred, so powerful. And whenever I cry back in the States, wanted to be back in the Pacific, I always think about the ocean and the beautiful phrase um, that the ocean is in us. We cry, we cry in sweat, salt water. And so I, I always believe that the ocean is healing and the ocean will come back and overtake, and not overtake, but like, like the tides, it's like back and forth. But as Pacific people, I think we're learning again, how to navigate that. And uh, I pre really appreciate all of you for um, continuing to be guiding stars um, for us to navigate this really immense ocean. So yeah, that is all I have to say. So thank you so much for, for uh, receiving this. Mahalo, Rowdy. That was, that was amazing. I loved your explanation. I'm, I hope we do get a chance to hook up in Seattle next week when we're there for a very brief visit. Um, but I, and thank you for also bringing um, Teresia's words back to us. I, um, you know, how do you not cry when we think about, um, Rimpak, when we think about Talisman Sabre, when we think about the ways in which other countries are coming to train to oppress um, in our waters. Uh, and, and there's very little recourse outside of mass demonstration and organizing that can stop it. Uh, because we've done all the testimony, we've done all the things, right? We do what we look at all the environmental impacts. They throw in thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of pages of data and document and assessment for us to not to be to hide to prevent us from being able to stand in front of their tanks. Uh, and then when we stand in front of their tanks, they throw laws at us that say we're terroristic. When we are the ones dealing with the terror of the state. When we are the ones who are dealing with a gen like genuinely insecure in the name of their national security. Uh, and we just got notification today that uh, in a press conference from our Board of Water Supply that the well, like one of the wells uh, in this Red Hill uh, situation now has cancer causing fuel chemicals uh, in the water and the plume is moving actually closer to where I live. Uh, so we've already shut down two wells and we may have to shut down a third. So these kinds of, these things like we, we need, if, where would we be without the artists imagining a different world? Where would we be right now? Scream, you know, artists writing a song, artists writing a poem. That's where we can breathe, right? Because where would we be right now if we, if we had no release at all, right? Culture being our greatest like buffer and place of breath, right? Um, and so mahalo so much and thank you so much for letting us use that image for uh, uh, kind of force, force that use of that image because it was like, this has got to go on a flyer somewhere. I don't know how. Oh, this is perfect. Um, and thank, I'm glad that you liked it. And to continue our reflections on the long, far-reaching impacts of impact, I'm going to ask um, Rosa to share some of her words and her reflections on this exhibition and militarism. Um, mahalo, Joy. Thank you for uh, everyone who already shared their amazing work. Um, I'm a bit... Um, <laughs> Um, I'm not really an artist, but uh, it was a challenge for me to, uh, when I was asked to prepare something, 
And for us, uh, in the Yang Solwara West Papua, it's it's a bit a challenge for us because uh, we only knew about RIMPEC recently, but it's already ongoing um, collaboration and training of um, you know military around the world. And for us, it becomes very important because Indonesia, as you know, that West Papua is occupied by Indonesia and it's run under a very militaristic uh, approach. And um, we found that uh, the RIMPAC is actually kind of a training place for the Indonesian military, especially Indonesian Navy, to prepare themselves to make stronger defense uh, across the region, especially across their uh, territory that they claim, including uh, West Papua territory, West Papua Ocean, and just find out that um, Indonesia military has been very actively participating in RIMPAC since 2014. And it's all related to the defense policy of Indonesian government to, to protect the territory, especially uh, ar um, around the West Papua Sea. Uh, so they have three uh, Navy based only in West Papua. So one is up north in Jayapura, which is uh, where I live. And then one is on the south, um, southern part of West Papua, very close to Australia border, uh, where my parents came from. So that's basically our customary territory. And then the other one is on the western part of West Papua, uh, which is the closest one to uh, other side of Indonesia. So from this position of putting the base, Navy base, it's, it's very clear that they want to actually kind of claiming us. And if I can connect with the, the painting, uh, the work done by Roldi, uh, I think I feel like we are now, uh, if, if I can see from the other perspective that, you know, you, you put very nice um, uh, reefs, coral reefs and this is beautifully done. But from when I first time see the picture of the, uh, on the flyer, I said, oh my God, I feel like my life is so uh, squeezed by all of this chaosity. And that exactly what the situation now in West Papua where all these military operations, are not only uh, Air Force, uh, military force, but also police being militarized and, and also like uh, a Navy, Indonesian Navy that uh, regularly have joint training with other uh, military uh, across the Pacific or in the region. So I think this is what the situation of West Papua right now that um, in the meantime, the West Papuan are busy with uh, struggling for self-determination, political recognition, but at the same time, we are already surrounded by this operation. And we didn't realize that until recently that we go, oh, wow, we are so busy looking after our internal inland affairs. And we didn't uh, aware that something also come and surrounding our ocean. And it's kind of, you know, try to trap us. So I feel like we, West Papua land is being squeezed and trapped with this all operation. So I didn't have um, any uh, work, artwork, but I always uh, inspired by our traditional uh, weaving bag. And I, I can show you. So this is uh, one, I, oh, I hope my, yeah, this is our traditional bag. Oh, I have, maybe I don't have to use the filter, right? Let me turn off this. Um, virtual background, so, sorry, no, okay, oh, sorry, it's my background is full of painting and artwork of my father, so <laughs> just try to continue that. <laughs> um, so this is the traditional bag um, made of bark, so this is the bark, um, so this one is made by my grandmother, so my grandmother weave this, and she gave it to me. And 
you know that in um in our culture like when grandmother pass the knowledge of weaving to the mothers and then mother will pass down to the daughter so that exactly what happened so this is from my grandmother and then this is made by my mother uh she gave it to me as well as a present and this is my work like unfinished work <laughs> i haven't finished this um it's a long process to finish this and this is like a process of reflecting what happened because um, in our traditional way, women always put the baby in inside this. And this is a smaller one, but the big one always being used. I think in Papua New Guinea, they also have the same culture with us. Uh, as you know, we share the land. Um, so in Papua New Guinea, they call it bilum. Uh, so inside this bag, we put baby. So life started from this. And for many of us in West Papua, especially for West Papuan women, this is like a uh, women's uh, womb. So it, it gives lives and it's protect the life. And our situation now is like, we busy to, uh, especially in my generation. So in the past, it's, it's been done nicely and smoothly and you know beautiful. But now is the challenge for me is, a lot of things going on. And when I'm trying to finish this and protect our life and many younger generations try to protect our life, we also get a challenge from outside. So, you know, when we process the materials like this to become like this, it takes some long step. Like, you know, we have to choose the, uh, the you know, we have to smooth the materials. We have to have certain, um, process of you know, putting water and make it smooth and then uh, try to make it like, um, you know, like this, and then you will weave it like this. And because of the situation, we even didn't have enough time to look after a process because all the materials, which is for me, materials is the West Papuans. All the materials become um, harder because because uh, because of the external factors. Uh, if we talk about this one, if we put it too uh, long outside and it's getting too much air and it becomes hard and it's difficult to weave. So that exactly what happened right now. Like many younger generation in West Papua, we we didn't connect to our roots very uh, very much because. Um, when Indonesia occupied us, they take a lot of uh, aspect of our values and culture. So we kind of, uh, the younger generation is kind of a loose, lost generation in terms of their connect to the culture. So now we, more younger generation try to find out what kind of roots, what kind of identity. And that's a learning process they've been doing and try to weave the life but at the same time, the challenge is still coming. So I was, I was thinking about presenting something like, you know, making a nice picture and the story, but I didn't have time, like a lot of things going on. And uh, at the moment with the highly military operations inland, like almost 10,000 uh, military forces uh, being deployed almost every year since 2018 until today and we have more than 60,000 uh, internal displaced peoples have to leave their village and seek um, uh, shelters and uh, safety place. It's, and then Indonesia came with the, the, with the policy of a division of administrations in West Papua. So it's a kind of, they breaking up our life. Like if, if this is a nice uh, bag that already you know, they come with the scissors and they cut it and make it, uh, you know, just break it. And we don't have something to hold in our lives. So, so our challenge now as a younger generation is how to re repair that traditional bag, repair our life in the middle of this situation. So I really appreciate um, the artwork that, um, all of our friends um, put on the exhibition. It's a it's a kind of connecting each of us with the issue, with this, uh, with the with the challenges, and 
it actually speak to all of us and connect us. As um, you all say that, you know, the ocean connect us, uh, that exactly what happened right now. And even what happened now in our ocean is kind of fear us because of this. You know, I, I, I watched the movie <laughs> Pacific Rim and I was like, wow, this is exactly what we are facing now, you know, that, that um, alien powers came and want to destroy all of us. And we, can, we cannot trust anybody. <laughs> like we have to really trust ourselves and, and uh, strengthening our uh, internal community, our indigenous community, our, uh, you know, our place where we live and try to weave ourselves together and protect ourselves. So, yeah, I want to leave it there. Thank you. Mahalo, Rosa. That was so uh, powerful. And that's beautiful work. I, I, you know, I love how you think you're not an artist and just that little bit, I was so excited. Because weaving like on that level is so hard for me. So I'm always impressed to see it. <laughs> if the village was relying on me to weave a basket for them, they'd be very hungry. Um, so I, I've tried. It's so hard. But like that level. And I think you touched on something that was incredibly important. And of course, now I'm going to have a coughing fit. <laughs> Excuse me. Um, the, the metaphor of it's not even a metaphor, the literal breaking of bags that you need to hold your children, to hold your food, to hold the, your possessions, to hold your life, to be cut, to be severed from that. And how do you consider, <coughs> how do you figure out how to repair that, right, is an incredibly powerful metaphor because we know how hard it is to mend the net when it's cut in the middle, right? Uh, it takes an expert, it takes a specialist, but more, it takes time and it also takes the material. Now we also know that Indonesia spends a lot of time. Thank you, Kim, for bringing me water. Um, takes a lot, actually goes out of its way to destroy the materials you would need, right? Much like in uh, Israel, they destroy olive trees for Palestinians. Like the things that you that are most precious to us is where the investment in, dis in destruction is. Um, but we know that um, we're we're still going to try and mend those those baskets. Those right, we need those to live. Um, I'm so sorry, I'm having a, like a major uh, choking fit. Uh, but um, I do want to also invite, there's one more person on the call who is not listed as a speaker, but who submitted and just did um, some amazing theater for RIMPAC just this week uh, and roped me into it. Uh, every year we on July 31st, we have an event called La Ho'i Ho'i Ea. That is a Hawaiian national holiday because in 1843, some British guy got mad that our courts didn't side with him and he decided to seize the kingdom of Hawaii and burn all of our flags. And for five months, five months, we were occupied by a British, some Brit or some random British man. Um, and our king, turn to this guy's higher up in the diplomatic way, right? It, through diplomacy. And that the other British per general, you know, um, Thomas came and told the other guy to hit the road. And we were able to restore our sovereignty. And we celebrate this every year. And there were vast celebrations throughout the country when that restoration happens. We know how much restoration and diplomacy matters, right? The recognition that we were a sovereign country, that we are a sovereign country, and that we don't need to have a standing army to expect people to behave in a way that supports humanity and life, right? Um, so on that day, we did some street theater that was 
keeping in mind that not everybody knows what satire and street theater is, we did a little bit of street theater and Kim was the writer and director and lead actor in that. So I'd like her to share just a little bit of that piece. I don't know if you, I, I don't think we have time to share the whole piece, but if you just want to talk about it, Kim. Well, hi everyone. Thank you for this beautiful gathering. Um, yeah, I, um, I guess when, RIMPAC began, I had this idea, like, how do we stay sane? How do we stay sane during RIMPAC? Because it's so devastating, as so many people have pointed out. And I ended up kind of reaching back into my old bag of tricks to think about um, humor, you know, because I think one of the main things they depend on, they think we're stupid. You know, they they, they um, keep talking about the destruction of the reef through these amphibious assault vehicles as if it's some kind of environmental program. Um, I mean, they literally, uh, you know, insult us with that kind of language. And so, yeah, I had this idea to, within the context of this Hawaiian sovereignty event that Joy was describing, to um, not just kind of, re you know, have a talking head educational kind of thing, but to try to do it through theater and to lampoon the ugliness that confronts us. And so I played Secretary Will Whitewash of the US Navy. And on either side of me was the Senator Limpiar, if anyone speaks Spanish, that's um, the, the cleanup man, the cleanup man who's very embarrassed by the secretary for being so plain spoken about um, you know wanting to get laid while he was in Hawaii and you know all of the bull, all the nonsense uh, uh, of, of militarism um, you know the state is trying to trying to make it sound like a green program like a brown pro, like an indigenous program like a LGBTQ friendly program etc. And then on the right of me is um, the CEO of uh, Lockheed Martin. So, uh, you know, thinking about not just the way that these imperial countries are destroying our environment, but the way that corporations are are guilty. They're kind of the silent partner that is, um, you know, making all the warmongers dreams come true. So, yeah, um, I'll put our in, in the chat if people are curious, but I'm, I've been doing some. Um, we're going to be in Waikiki tomorrow morning. <laughs> <laughs> we're going into the belly of the beast because uh, RIMPAC, I think, is ending today. And so tomorrow, conceivably, like all of the 25,000 military personnel or whoever's left here are going to be partying. It's Friday um, and they're going to be uh, down there, um, uh, you know, celebrating. And so we want to poop that party and help the <laughs> help our uh you know free thinking people in here in Hawaii to um as we say like to give the people the last laugh to give the people the last laugh and to um uh demonstrate what a proper functioning media might look like so we have we at Aloha we had young Kanaka women um on the mic pretending to be journalists you know pointing the finger at at the the um the men in power um, and asking the hard questions that unfortunately our media does not ask, which, um, you know, the, um, was it uh, um, Louisa, I think, who, who pointed that out about the, um, no, is it? Um, I'm sorry, I've forgotten. The, the, the first speaker, the Fijian sister, Tale, excuse me, um, was talking about the role of the media. I think that that's been a big part of what's been so devastating about impact not just what they do but how they describe it you know they describe it in such um celebratory terms so the yeah the, the skit has been a way for us to speak back to that the, the to that heva as the hawaiians say to that disgrace that that um that sin thanks everybody love well look him um i'm yeah Tomorrow's the official close, so that'll be an interesting close to the exercises that shall not be named, that should not exist. Um, the We are pretty much at time, but if folks have questions for any of our artists, uh, 
Does anyone have questions or want to make any comments before we close, Aguino? Um, <clears throat> sorry, I'm, I'm not an artist, no, I'm poet. Um, I remember back in the days, uh, my grandfather used to say, um, if you don't participate, if you feel like uh, you're useless, all you have to do is keep thanking the people who are moving the movement forward. So on behalf of, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Hagino, and I'm part of the Young Solwara Secretary team. Uh, apologies, the rest of the members couldn't join. Um, yeah, but on behalf of the team, we'd like to thank Joy, especially for putting all of this together. It was such an, well, from my side, I don't have a good experience with uh, the website, but so far I'm learning, I'm learning from the best. Uh, thank you so much, Joy, for putting all of this together, not forgetting our um, artists. Um, it was really beautiful, the gallery on our website I was just scrolling through this morning and it was really amazing the work that was done. Uh, thank you so much for your contribution, uh, your commitment to the movement, to the cause. Um, also to our speakers, thank you, Rosa, Joey, um, Nick, um, for, especially for Rosa and Nick for um, accepting our invitation. I know you guys have uh, busy schedules. Um, Thank you so much for your time. Um, it's nice to see you, Rosa. Uh, also, yeah, thank you to everyone that's uh, tuned in this afternoon. Yes. Thank you so much, Naka. Naka. I also want to say uh, mahalo nui loa to uh, Young Solwara Pacific, to Peng, to Protehi La Texan Saber Tidian, to the um, OCW 670 to Pacific Peace Network and to all of our sponsors uh, for allowing us to imagine this. This uh, this could be done. Uh, I was I was when RIM, just before RIMPAC started. I I reached out to Young Sawara because for me to make this to talk about militarism in the Pacific, it has to be the whole Pacific. Uh, it has to be all the people who are impacted. So for, there are many people that were involved from uh, Japan and Korea and Okinawa and other parts of the Pacific uh, that aren't on this call, but who contributed to this, which shows the far reach um, and the importance of us being able to talk about peace. Uh, one of the things that a good friend of mine just talked about today, uh, earlier today, is that they've actually, when we speak about peace, they want, and we wanna talk about the actual impact on our environments, on our landscapes, they call us terrorists and they try to shut us down. They've actually weaponized and believe they have the claim to the word peace as if peace comes at the end of a gun. Peace does not ever exist at the end of the barrel of a gun. We know that all of this, all of these exercises, all of this military readiness is to secure economic capitalist trade lanes. It is for the extraction of resources, whether that be from the bottom of the ocean or in our most sacred mountains. This is about extraction of resources and capitalism and, and, and protecting property. That is all the military is doing. It is protecting military abroad for corporate folks. The police protect property domestically. They're, they're one in the same. We know that this is what this is, right? So let's stop talking about this as some issue of security. They're not securing us. They are securing trade for themselves. And in the process, they have no problem poisoning our waters and, de and devastating our homelands. And they will do that because they believe there's always another frontier. And we know that this is our home, right? Um, and so mahalo for all of, of all of you. You know, it is definitely my goal to, to have this go on. We will be hopefully bringing up folks from 
West Papua and Kanaki and the Solomons and, and all of the South Pacific to come up to Hawaii in 2024 to have a Pacific summit and disrupt disrupt the, the politeness that we're supposed to have around the occupation of our countries. So thank you again. If you still want to submit work, please submit work. If you have friends that want to submit work, I'm always checking the website. So, and I will be happy to put it up and we can even expand it to beyond RIMPAC, which is what it's gonna become. So thank you. Just uh, any other closing thoughts before we close for the day? Nope. Okay. Mahalo everyone. Have a wonderful day. Wonderful day, night, evening, morning. Uh, Hagino, if you can stay on for a little bit longer after we close. And um, Nate, if you could stay a little bit longer after we close. Okay. We're going to stop the recording. All right. Okay.